thank you for the great honor to uh, be able to give this presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Schelto Kruijf. I'm a surgeon from the Netherlands. I'm a surgical oncologist and work in Groningen in the upper north of the Netherlands. Just from a bit of a background, I did my um, surgical training in the Netherlands and afterwards I uh, differentiated for um, specifically for the oncology teaching. I've worked in Australia for quite a while, specifically for thyroid cancer and um, other endocrine diseases. And um, um, in my background as a general doctor and later also last summer, I worked in uh, Malawi for quite a bit. So I was invited to, um, to give a lecture about uh, cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa and the increasing problem. Um, so I'll try to sort of do my best today to see if I can tell you a bit about um, that exploding issue we have. Um, right now it's not responding. Okay, thanks. So um, here you see the Nkoma Hospital. It's a, a big rural hospital uh, just a little bit south of Lilongwe, which is the, um, uh, a big city in the north of uh, Malawi. Um, as a young doctor, I worked uh, in Malawi um, and um, uh, for quite a bit. And then later, when I finished my training last summer, um, I worked for a couple of months uh, in Malawi again as a surgeon. I also went on a couple of uh, missions going to Kenya and uh, Migori, um, where I saw a lot of uh, Kenyan patients. Um, so here you see the Malawian hospital and Coma Hospital, uh, which have has a warm heart in my uh, warm place in my heart, uh, where I spent uh, a, a lot of time in my life uh, doing the physician uh, work. It's a beautiful hospital with a huge uh, um, uh, efferent for uh, people coming from uh, Mozambique and, uh, um, all, of course, Malawi uh, for all kinds of treatments. So I went there as a young doctor when I was uh, um, in 2005. I think I was about 28. And um, uh, as a surgeon, 15 years later, I returned. And um, there were a couple of things that changed drastically. And I will tell you a bit more about that today. So to start with, when I came back, um, what I saw is that the communication between the doctors and between the different centers had changed drastically. So if we had an emergency case, it was much easier to call the large academic hospital and tell them that we had a trouble some case and ask them for help or maybe even transfer the patient in the ambulance. So there was also much better infrastructure, better roads and a better electricity network. So we were not so dependent anymore on the hospital battery that was going on and out. But what I also saw is a much more use of plastics, much more uh, supermarkets, more cars, more use of Western food. And medically, especially, I saw that there was a lot more cancer, a lot more cancer in the hospital, where I didn't see rarely any types of cancer when I was back in 2005. Right now, last year in 2019, it was all over the place. And this made me wonder what happened to Malawi? What was the big difference? So I, of course, looked around, asked around and talked to a lot of professionals that were working in Malawi and are working today. But I also went and read a lot of literature to see what, 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 what's the difference. And the main difference that you can see from the data is that um, Malawi, the life expectation in Malawi has increased a lot from 40.2 years when I was in 2000 to 56.2 in 2016. This is a major difference. This is more than we have had post-World War II in Europe. So what is the reason of this sudden increase in life expectation? There are a couple of reasons uh, that cause this, and one of this is the drastic reduction of pediatric mortality, probably mainly because of the fighting of the HIV AIDS epidemic, which is uh, slowly getting some ground and also the increased uh, organization of the TBC treatment that is, has much improved. 
But the other difference also was, and I did something that you could see around my hospital, around in the village, that the malnutrition had decreased. Of course, in Malawi, which is still a very poor country, in a certain part of the season, there's a very a scarcity of food, but still the living standards had increased. If you see this from a worldwide perspective, you can see where the where the arrow is. This is where Malawi is next to the Lake Malawi, and you can actually see that it is still um, the life expectation is one of the uh, lowest worldwide. Um, but still, it is between 55 and 61, which is much more than um, uh, 15 years ago. So what is actually happening? So um, there's a, a, a book that was written by Hans Rosling, um, and it is a very impressive book, which I really advise you to read. And it tells us about the different approaches um, of uh, the way to look at the world population. If you look at the world population, we can actually, Hans Rosling divided the world population, their living standards in different levels. Level one, level two, level three, and level four. And most of us do not have an accurate, accurate worldview how the wealth in the world is divided as we speak. So if you look for, in, for level one, most people that live on the level of level one they only eat one type of porridge, they sleep on the ground, they wa walk barefooted, and they have a scarcity of drinking water. The people that live on level two have already more infrastructure. They eat a bit more diverse, and they um, ha share drinking water, for instance, with their village. Uh, and people in level three, etc., etc., they have even a more um, wealthy menu. They sleep in a bed, and they have a motorcycle, etc., till level four, where people have a car, have drinking water in their own house, and uh, have a, all have a bed. If you look at the division of the world population, most people in the last decades have moved to level two. And this is where they start changing their life conditions. They start eating different types of food, the more of the Western type of food, and they start uh, developing the diseases that we already have in Europe. So what you can actually see is that right now, the worldwide childbirth rate is already going down. But despite this, the world population is still increasing and will probably increase until 11 billion in 2070. So the growth of the population is mainly defined by the reduction in pediatric mortality. And that's what also changed in Malawi. And in the future, at the end of this century, our new balance in population, as Hans Rosling says, will be with life instead of death, where there were born families with six children, where four children died. Now two children will be born and they will stay alive and they will become old. And that's where we pay the price for a large world population that we have to share but also where we are going to develop same diseases. Here you see, can see a slide developed by Hans Rosling, where you can actually see that here, you see the children that are being born in 2015. But where now, of those two children, those two will stay alive till 2075. And every 15 years, there's new children that will stay alive and will stay alive. So we have to add, that population to the current population going on to 11 billion in 2075 and then probably uh, we will go down in our in our population. So this makes us think that um, if we are going to develop the same also the same living standards that means that we will get more physical inactivity in Africa, we'll get more alcohol abuse, more tobacco use, more unhealthy diets which is essentially will lead to diabetes, heart problems, and cancer. And this is probably one of the reasons why cancer has been increasing so much. So there's a reduction of infection, also infection-related cancers. So especially the non-communicable diseases uh, related to cancer have increased in 2004 from 25% to in 2030, 
almost predicted to be 46 percent this is a major major difference so here you can see a, a root map with the difference uh, in the cancer epidemic that is spreading around the world this was still in 2015 and you can see a little red dot in south africa um, and uh, but mainly here africa is still uh, yellow but this is slowly changing i would just uh, remove this because i can't see my own screen um, i wonder whether this will go fine uh, cancel okay so there will be in, an increase from 12.7 million in 2008 to 14.1 million people with cancer so cancer related new deaths rose from 7.6 million in 2008 to 8.2 million in 2012 so these are impressive numbers here you can see the actual um, um, incidence of the different tumors. So you see for males, the main problem in Africa, which I saw in Malawi as well, is um, uh, uh, prostate, and then of course, uh, liver cancer, but also esophagus, Kaposi related to HIV sarcoma, and stomach cancer. And in uh, females, I see a lot of, we see a lot of cervix carcinoma and breast carcinoma. So what are the factors changing and making this cancer epidemic going? So what I told you before, it's the changing demographic transition that is doing it. It's the increased consumption of processed foods, lifestyle differences, use of tobacco, and a different uh, um, different uh, food patterns and also the climate change uh, that is um, changing the lifestyle and uh, the uh, carcinogenic factors. So if you compare the uh, survival after the cancer diagnosis uh, that's also completely different. So the cancer survival um, when a person is diagnosed with cancer um, we can also call it a mortality versus incident uh, ratio. And um, sorry, I'm just moving this because I can't see. You can still see me? So, um, where we look at the uh, IRC when we calculate it for, the, uh, um, for somebody that is diagnosed with cancer. In, um, uh, in South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the mortality versus incidence ratio is about 72%, which means that most of the people that are diagnosed with cancer will, ex will eventually die. Um, when we compare this to the mortality versus incidence ratio in Europe, this is calculated to be 44%, which means that we are able to cure at least more than half of the people that have cancer. So what are the causes of this high mortality? So if you have cancer, but then there's even a lack of cure. What is the reason of this lack of curing when you have cancer in uh, sub-Saharan Africa? Well, there is currently a lack of knowledge and a lack of experience on the global scale in diagnosing cancer. People are getting, for instance, uh, TBC treatment when they have metastasized thyroid cancer. And this is not because they are bad. There are bad doctors or bad uh, uh, clinical officers. No, the reason is that there's still a focus still on AIDS, malaria, and TBC, which is completely understandable because these are currently still the major threats for the patient. Patient delay is a very big problem. Patients come very late with a late stage cancer presentation, and this gives them a poor prognosis and often need for palliative care. And there's lack of scientific knowledge. So there's no local, there's little local research uh, that's been done to increase the knowledge about that, the types of cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa, because our research, the European or the American research, is different in different conditions, different circumstances. 
So why is this patient delay? The patients that live in Malawi have a lack of access to medical care facilities. There's an extreme poverty, and this is still an obstacle to seek help due to the high cost of the hospital and the missed income. People don't have insurances, and, and when they leave their house, uh, their little company will collapse uh, because there's nobody doing the work anymore. There's a cultural tendency to primarily seek help of traditional healers. Um, uh, every village has an own traditional healer, and uh, this gives a lot of delay. Uh, and patients coming with infected wounds and other problems. There's a lack of education um, for the patients as well, what cancer exactly is, and this leads to both fear and denial of disease. Also, cancer is still very much in the taboo atmosphere where uh, victims are cast away by, by their own family members. Um, cancer sometimes is seen as a punishment from something from higher powers or something contagious. So this is all factors that lead eventually to delay. And delay in cancer eventually just gives you a much smaller opportunity to be cured. So this is a very pessimistic start of the talk. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, and now we have to look at the future, which is much more important is how are we going to improve this cancer care? The most important part of this solution to the problem is just to improve the education and knowledge about cancer. Cancer is in Africa a relatively new problem. So it's been there for a while, but the explosion the way it does now is a new situation. So there has also the public awareness needs to be increased because there's doctors that can know a lot in hospitals. But first, the most important part is that patients are going to seek help in time. We have to improve medical networks so that rural hospitals have a very low threshold to collaborate with academic places. And the preventive medicine has to be developed better like cancer screening, picking up diseases in an earlier stage of disease. But one of the most important topics that I want to talk about today is that we have to improve the surgical training because I think surgery is a very important treatment uh, in oncology care. Education. So local straightforward and repetitive education just about the main cancers in Africa is very important for local doctors. We have to develop oncology training programs for clinicians and we have to change medical curricula uh, so that cancer has a prominent place in the education programs. We can do webinars like we do today for lots of students so that people are aware of the cancer problem and know a little bit about it. And today I have a very broad talk about cancer care. It's also possible to focus, for instance, only on one topic, for instance, rectal cancer, and go more into the depth. And the main goal of this all is to share the oncology knowledge. Because if you know much more about cancer, if you understand the disease, then the treatments uh, can be initiated much easier. But also very important, and which something that we in Europe, and I speak for myself, take a little bit for granted, is that we keep forgetting that public awareness is very important. If patients don't know that something is wrong or that something is not well, and they don't seek help, and delay occurs. The European and the Dutch patient is a very assertive patient that reads a lot about cancer, knows a lot about the cancer, and when they have some um, deformity in their body, they will seek help from their general practitioner. In Malawi, people react very late when they have a problem, uh, just because they are not aware that this is something life-threatening. So health talks about this topic in the rural communities and schools is very important that people know about cancer just like they did and we did in Malawi and the other countries around for uh, the HIV problem, for instance. So collaboration with local chiefs of villages and other religious or spiritual leaders is a very important thing. Prevention of the development of malignant diseases 
should be part of nationwide health programs. Children should know early that tobacco, alcohol, lots of sugar is a very bad thing for your body. Lifestyle related adjustments like the reduction of smoking, alcohol and consumptions is uh, very important. And I hope that Africa will not do the same in the next decades that Europe and the United States have done. So education is pivotal, implemented already in primary school. Cancer should be um, taken out of the taboo atmosphere and children should be aware of it in an early phase. Medical networks are very important. Here you see uh, me standing with a Kenyan team in Migori. And one of the most important thing of that was is that we were working with a local Kenyan uh, doc with the local Kenyan doctors and surgeons, and that we were exchanging our um, knowledge. And um, in Migori, which is quite a, a big village, uh, we had very close contact with a, a very big hospital in the neighborhood where we could get advice if we had a difficult treatment or if a patient was not, uh, we were not able to treat it in Migori. So um, we, a network between rural hospitals and larger hospitals is very important also to exchange knowledge, to exchange trainees and other doctors that can work in a larger hospital and work in a rural hospital to do experience uh, for both types of hospitals. But also the increase of usage of um, WhatsApp groups, but also it's possible even to to guide somebody during an operation, supervise them from a from a distance with a head camera. There's a lot possible these days with all the um, new options that we have with cameras and digital uh, infrastructure. And also exchange with visiting specialists from other larger African centers is something that uh, you can arrange on a regular basis. So screening programs, sadly, I think screening programs uh, are, I haven't seen much of them uh, in Malawi, for instance. Uh, although I have to say that the screening program for cervical cancer uh, was quite well developed. Uh, but nationwide screening programs uh, need a full financial support by governments and NGOs, which uh, quite often now is not the situation. But as I said in the beginning, um, I want to emphasize that the solution for oncology treatment is surgery. I think surgery has a lot of advantages. Firstly, as a cancer treatment, it has relatively low costs. It is within reach. That means that if we train people well, um, um, it is payable. It has a direct effect. There's also surgery for curative options, but also for palliative options. And it is independent of medical industry. That means if we have knives, if we have instruments, if we have an OR, and if we have good people, we can do good surgery. The only thing is, for surgery, you need a lot of experience to get a good outcome. And therefore, training is a very important thing. For instance, here you see, oh, you see, I think the pictures of my presentations are not there. Can you help me with that? Do you see the pictures in my presentation? Hello? Yes, we're here. Do you see um, uh, the pictures of the patients, Dave? I don't uh, see them on I my see screen. Your slide uh, metastasized thyroid cancer, but no uh, images on the screen. It's empty, right? Correct. What do you want me to do? Because it's a bit of a shame. I want to show them. Shall I, I, I'm sure they are there. Uh -huh. Shall I reopen the presentation? Slide, please. Sorry? Go back one slide, please. Um, yeah. I click on the, the slideshow. Okay, there we go. And then go forward. And there should be images on the slide. No, it's not. I'm sure I checked the presentation before I um, uh, go started. forward. Yeah, now this one is back. 
and this one is still gone. Okay, that's a shame. Um, I will just continue the talk then. I um, yeah. I just wanted to show you some uh, pictures of uh, uh, treatments that you can easily do when you are an experienced surgeon. Uh, one of them was two patients with metastasized thyroid cancer, which I'm sure I had the pictures on this slide. Uh, but unfortunately, I think maybe there's a digital problem. Um, can, but one can, of them uh, was. If you uh, forward me your slides, I can upload them to the website for our participants to uh, okay. see as well. So. That's fine. I will send that. Yeah, sure. Uh, one of them was a young lady that uh, presented with metastasized, uh, lymphogenic metastasized thyroid cancer. And uh, she had the problem already for two years. And we were very much able to uh, to operate on her. It was a very long procedure, almost a day. But uh, three days later, she went home. And she had been walking with that problem for two years, had a very bad life. And uh, I I talked to her a couple of weeks later, and she was uh, was very happy. Miss, uh, thyroid cancer is a problem uh, that you can um, quite well treat uh, with surgery. Another one was an elderly lady that had, a big, had metastasized thyroid cancer and had a big swelling lump on her breast that we removed. Unfortunately, we were not able to cure her, but by removing the lump, um, she felt she could go back to her village again. And uh, we, um, I think, increased her quality of life uh, very much. One of the other ladies here, you could see, uh, these are just a couple of examples, what you can do with only a knife uh, for cancer treatment. This lady had a parotid tumor and it was growing and growing. And here you see how we uh, have removed the tumor and she has an open wound. And here you can actually see how uh, even the facial nerve was spared and she didn't have any uh, morbidity after the procedure. Um, and so she was also a very happy lady. Um, this was another patient of ours of a lady that came in with a squamous cell carcinoma. This is also a type of cancer that we see, we saw a lot in Malawi, probably sun, uh, sun induced. Uh, sometimes it starts with a small scar and then it starts uh, growing. Um, and here we remove the tumor, um, unfortunately not with a very large margin, but um, uh, we replaced it with a uh, nice skin graft and it grew in uh, very nicely. This is not very complex surgery, but for this patient, this problem is very big. And it is a three or, no, I think even two or three hour uh, operation, uh, but with a huge uh, increase of um, quality. Here we have another um, slide, unfortunately, without a very relevant picture. And it was uh, showing a, a, a picture of a 70 year old guy that had a huge tumor on the upper leg and that we um, uh, doubted on to operate. Eventually, um, uh, we took our chances and removed the tumor and replaced it by a, a, a split skin graft. Um, this treatment uh, was not a day treatment. Patient came in, first we optimized um, his nutrition and then when he was much stronger, we removed uh, the tumor and then uh, had an open wound waited till uh, we knew the pathology results and when we knew that the tumor had been removed uh, well enough we replaced it with a split, split skin graft. Hopefully these pictures uh, I can show you later on the website. One of the reasons that treatments like this are not being performed quite often is um, because cancer surgery quite often in Malawi, for instance, is only available in larger urban hospitals. And that's because people, doctors feel little safety nets, such as intensive care or donor blood transfusion, or the availability of, of surgeons that are experienced if problems arise. Also, for the surgeon, the nutritional state of the patient is very important. And when you have patients with malaria or tuberculosis or HIV, um, they have a reduced preoperative fitness. And often this leads to a lot more of complications postoperatively. So, of course, the condition of the patient is a large threshold uh, when, they, when, they, when the fitness is not there to perform uh, large procedures. 
surgical training, I think, is essential. And there's hundreds of thousands uh, good surgeons needed in uh, the continent of Africa to make sure that we can treat the cancer that we are expecting. And um, fortunately, training initiatives like COSEXCA, PAX and Surge Africa are working on a daily basis to increase the amount of surgical specialists and to increase the opportunity to treat the patients. And also, I want to emphasize that palliative surgery is a very important treatment in palliative care. So, for instance, you, it's not always necessary to only cure with a knife. You can do a lot of other things for your patient with a surgical treatment. For instance, we um, treated a patient with rectal cancer that uh, didn't have, um, uh, that couldn't have uh, feces anymore, and we uh, delivered him a deviating stoma. Um, for gastric cancer bleeding, you can do an endoscopic ligation. And endoscopy and ligating a bleeding is something that is achievable in a rural hospital. Um, also, like I showed you before, skin tumors, breast and soft tissue sarcoma, thyroid cancer, surface carcinoma are all uh, diseases that can be treated by the knife. Oncology, even oncology amputations, if needed, are possible and deviating cystostomies for patients with bladder cancer or patients with um, head and neck cancers that can barely breathe and need a tracheostoma. So palliative care, um, Kelly, treatment in South Sub-Saharan Africa is also something that is drastically um, uh, needed, more needed every day. This is one of the papers that was published in The Lancet in 2013, showing that the numbers of patients that need palliative care in the future are increasing very rapidly. So roughly half a million of people die of cancer now every year, and end of care, life care for cancer, uh, receives far less attention, understandable again, than uh, it does for instance for HIV. Here's an example of a situation when we went on a palliative outreach where we encountered uh, this young albino child of 16 years old with a massive uh, squamous cell carcinoma who was just lying there in one of the uh, places on the ground waiting to die with, uh, a, with almost no um, pain or comfort. Um, we tried to take him to the hospital, revalidate him, feed him and then try to uh, organize a center with, where you could still have some radiation to um, minimize the tumor. But um, the parents uh, and the child himself were not motivated enough uh, anymore to do all this. And unfortunately later he, um, he died. And this is one of the situations where you want a child like this at least to be palliated well. Uh, with a good pain comfort. What's the definition of palliative care? Well, palliative care improves the quality of life among patients and families with life-threatening illnesses by relief of suffering by means of early treatment of pain. And this can be physical, psychosocial or spiritual. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that palliative care is beneficial in improving quality of life but also in improving outcomes and sometimes even uh, survival. So, as I told you, palliative care is still somewhat in its infancy in Sub-Saharan Africa, but actually the patients that need palliative care the most are living in low and middle income countries, uh, which is Sub-Saharan Africa still. So, where it's actually needed the most, it is developed uh, very little um, and that's actually quite tragic. So one of the main pillars of this problem is there's still a lack of pain treatment. So it's estimated that in LEMCs about 20 million people die each year with severe pain that could easily have been alleviated with just uh, morphine. And another 28 million pa pa patients that did not die um, they tried to give morphine, 
but the, um, it was not accessible. So only 3.6% of the available opioid painkillers are available in low and middle income countries. Here you can see the inequity in the distribution, where you can see that um, in the United States, in Australia, in Europe, um, morphine is very widely available, but especially in the red area, um, there is a very uh, little availability of uh, morphine. So we can see, say that there's actually a kind of a opiophobia. Opioids are not accessible for patients in need, and they can only be prescribed by medical officers. And one of the reasons probably is that governments um, fear misuse, and um, that's why they um, hesitate in uh, um, giving the opioids available to the patients. But it is possible, and in Uganda, uh, the country showed an efficient morphine regulation, storage, prescribing, and a good consumption program without abuse being reported. And the success, fac the success factors were probably a regulate, regulate supply at national level, um, support by the district and uh, health authorities, monitoring, nurse training, and a continuous food supply. So we did a review of the literature and looked at uh, uh, selected papers just to see how palliative care was organized for every diff for uh, uh, sub-Saharan countries. Um, and we looked at the main pillars when you look at palliative care, and we look at the policy, the education, the medication, pain medication, of course, and the implementation of palliative care. So here you see, um, what the status is of the different countries and the status of their uh, uh, palliative care situation. For instance, in Botswana, uh, we could see that there is a general five-year national palliative care strategy, and I won't go through the whole table, but just taking it as, a as a, an example. Uh, we will provide the slides later. There is also a good, well-developed palliative care training, and um, there is a national pain management guideline. There is um, unfortunately only prescription possible by medical officers. And there's three hospitals, hospices that are providing palliative care. There's of course insufficient capacity, but um, um, in relation to other countries, Botswana has quite well developed palliative care system. But if you look for instance at Malawi, there is a palliative care association in Malawi, but there is a lack of national guidelines. There is no specific palliative care education. There is a lack of available drugs, and the workforce is very scarce. So Malawi um, has still a lot of work to do. Of course, as we all expected, if you look at South Africa, there's a very well-developed palliative care situation with a specific association running this with a good mentorship program, with a widespread availability, and with 102 palliative care units. So that's something I think uh, where we should um, try to work towards, uh, but this needs support by uh, governments. And inadequate policy making is of course the main obstacle in low and middle income countries where there's often unstable governments, and sometimes even widespread corruption. And evidence, but there's evidence enough about the effectiveness of palliative care um, and showing it that it is cost effective to organize your palliative care in a country very well. And the reason is that if you make sure that you're, as a country, have a well developed palliative care system, you can have the patient that cannot be cured in a hospital uh, live at home and stay at home. And this saves a lot of costs. And of course, it's not about the costs, but the quality for the patient is also much better to stay at home if the hospital is not able to provide cure. But to, to achieve this, we need to make sure that there's a better registration. Right now, uh, we, don't, uh, we can't see how many patients we are treating, how many costs we are reducing, 
and therefore it's also very difficult to mobilize governments to pay for a good palliative care system. Also, education in palliative care is very important. We need medical training for medical and clinical officers and nurses. Um, but we are still much focused on treating infectious diseases and um, mother and child care. And we have to make sure that we shift towards providing comfort and maintaining quality of life um, in palliative care patients instead of um, staying in the treatment mode for too long when cure cannot be provided anymore. And that's something that we have to train our professionals. That means that we have to make sure there's a change in mindset from a treatment perspective towards an open conversation where we talk with our patients and explain that there's no more cure that can be provided. And that means that we have to learn our professionals to uh, bring bad news uh, with all honesty so families can make an honest decision and take their mothers and fathers back home without uh, being without paying a very high bill for the hospital that they are not able to pay but often we see and that's something that i saw as well that clinicians do not want to take the hope of the patients in the hospital of the giving the news of an incurable disease but this is something that is very relevant um, if you want to provide good palliative care. So, end of life at home, question mark. Patients are still dying quite often in the hospitals in the hope of having some miraculous cure. But if we pay more attention to required care at home and uh, um, make sure that the expectations of the families are also um, different about getting some miraculous cure in the hospital, they will be motivated earlier to go home uh, where there's a, a good care situation and family around it. So, um, excuse me for this uh, long talk, but it was quite a challenging topic. But what I've tried to tell you today in my conclusion is the following. I think in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the demography is dramatically changing and adapts Western disease patterns with, of course, the accompanying uh, high numbers of cancer. Lack of knowledge and means of lack of knowledge and means of patient and hospital leads to delay and high mortality in the cancer patient at this at this time. A high quality curative and palliative surgery delivered by skilled staff, I think, is the best short-term solution to the problem. I think right now, for most of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the availability of, for instance, chemotherapy and radiation is not realistic. And also, surgery is often um, uh, a, a treatment that can provide cure on a short-term basis, which is also financial um, capable of doing so. Palliative care and pain medication availability should be much more strongly adopted by governments. And worldwide cancer education for level, level one countries is crucial to change the landscape. So that's why in uh, March 2021, uh, we with my team and with a team from Blantyre would really much like to organize an oncology course in Blantyre, Malawi, for which we will invite registrars and clinical officers and um, uh, all physicians that provide primary care in the hospitals. And the main goal of this course and future similar initiatives, initiatives will be to provide interaction and share knowledge about cancer care between local clinicians and visiting oncologists. So I want to welcome you there. Um, I just want to explain here, you see a typical Dutch um, item. This is a Dutch windmill and all the students you see on that photo are uh, students that are participating in a, the Dutch um, summer school oncology. And um, this is a summer school that's been organized for more than 20 years where students around the whole world visited our city of Groningen 
to get an um, education of more than 10 days about cancer care. Every day another cancer topic. And here you see the picture that we made at the end of the 10 days. So this formula, reducing it to five days, we want to adapt and build the first Malawian summer school in 2021. So five days of oncology education. Let's make to start. Let's start to make a difference at a place where the impact can be really significant. Uh, welcome. I hope to welcome you uh, uh, next year, March in Blantyre. Thank you uh, for your attention.